The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tyler Lay, at, uh, who's an assistant professor at Oklahoma State University, Stillwater, Oklahoma, and he's going to talk to us about a coarseness, workability, consolidation of concrete mixtures, which is a new approach to mixture design. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Tyler Lay, associate professor at Oklahoma State University, and the title of my talk is Coarseness, Workability, Consolidation, a New Approach, and I didn't come up with the title, okay? Um, uh, but. Um, I don't really even know what it means, but I, it's, it, it sounds really cool, though. It sounds really, really cool. But I'm going to be talking, um, first I'm going to say, um, these are the folks that um, help pay the bills. I have to um, say, say thanks to them up front, and this is an outline of my talk. And I'm going to be talking about optimized graded concrete for concrete pavements. That's what it's all about, optimized graded concrete for concrete pavements. And the goal of optimized graded concrete is to increase the volume of our aggregate in our mixture so we can decrease the volume of the pace. That's what it's all about. Paste, that's binder, that's water, that's air. The paste happens to be the most costly, the least sustainable, and the concrete has the, the um, ingredient or the, the, the uh, component in our concrete that has the biggest impact on durability. If we can minimize paste, we're going to be doing lots and lots of good things for our concrete mixtures. For you graphical learners out there, um, if we show drying time up here on the x-axis, we show shrinkage on the y-axis. If I made things out of paste, if I made cement driveways, then they would shrink to death, right? And they would crack themselves up. We need to add aggregate to them. And if we just had aggregate driveways, they wouldn't shrink, but they sure wouldn't hold together very, very, very uh, well. So we're going to use concrete. Concrete's a composite material, a mixture of aggregate and paste together. And so it shrinks less. And by making optimized graded concrete, all we're going to be doing is jamming more and more aggregate in, more and more aggregate in, and we can decrease that shrinkage and hence decrease our cracking. So how do you design optimized graded concrete? Well, there's three main steps. You've got to find your aggregate gradation, number one. You have to find the volume and the consistency of your paste. Not all concrete mixtures need the same amount of paste and the same consistency. What I mean is like a paving mixture. You can get away with a very low paste content, but a, a bridge deck, you need much more paste, much more flowable paste. You have to understand that. You have to tune your mix to the application. And finally, we're going to check strengths check durability, that's the final step. So how do you find gradation? There's three primary techniques out there. The Shieldstone box, the 818 curves, and the Power 45. And I don't know if you folks have used those much, but all three of them give you different answers. All three of them give you different answers. So which one's right? What do these tools really tell us? And is one better than the other? And that's what we're all about today. That's what we're trying to figure out. I'm going to introduce um, just a few of them. Um, the Shillstone box right here, we've got workability um, chart or work, workability factor plotted um, on the y-axis. We've got coarseness factor plotted on the x. And um, you, you want to be in the box. You want to be in this box. And, and um, Shillstone actually said that you don't necessarily want to be in the center. It depends on what your application is. But most folks, have, I guess that's kind of been forgotten um, um, over time. And most folks say, you need to be in the box. DOTs often say, well, if you, if you can be inside the bigger box, let's put safety factors on it, because safety factors must, must mean something. And we're going to force you to be in some smaller box. But if you go back and look at the literature, there's almost no technical validation for any of this. Um, if, if, we, if, if we look at this, this other curve, this typical percent retained curve, also called the 818 curve, this is a different way of looking at your aggregate gradation. Instead of looking at percent passing, we look at how much is caught, how much is actually retained on the different sieve sizes. So we have fine aggregates over here, we have intermediate in the middle, we have coarse, and these curves that are produced, often called the haystack curve, 
has to total to 100%. And the, the, common, the common recommendation is you want to be somewhere between 18 and 8. Again, this is a, a, an awesome chart um, developed by um, Shillstone again, but there is no technical reason for 18 and 8. He actually just pulled it out of the air one day in an ACI meeting when he was just pushed on this chart. Again, but people often say you want to have some kind of haystack shape, shape curve. Again, almost no um, real uh, laboratory data to back this up. So what are our goals? We actually want to find gradations that um, allow reduced paste contents for concrete pavements. Remember, it's all about concrete pavements. We need enough workability, but not too much. We want the concrete to be placeable. We want it to be vibratable, but not too much because the concrete has to hold an edge. It has to hold an edge. So we have a window of workability. It has to be workable enough so that you can consolidate it, but not too workable. But as the paver passes, that you lose your edge and you have to use side forms, right? The window of workability. And the slump test tells us nothing. It doesn't tell us anything. At this really low um, slump concrete, it doesn't help, it doesn't help us. It tells us the slump. So if we start to think about a slip form paver, what part of the paver is doing the energy? What part of the paver is doing all of the work? And it's all about the vibrator. It's all about the vibrator, right? The vibrator is what's pu putting all this energy in, in, inside our, our concrete pavement. And if, if we can mimic this action of this vibrator, then we have an idea to try to mimic how a concrete paver works without buying one, right? That would be a awesome, right? If we come up with a laboratory way to look at concrete pavements and, and the, their mixtures. So we want a test that's simple. That's number one. If you know me very well, I, I'm a simple person. I, I like simple things. We, we want to measure the response of the mixture to vibration. That's what it's all about. We, we, we're, we're really trying to find, as we apply energy to that mixture, how does that grout fill? How does it fill? And, and then we, we have to be able to hold an edge. So again, it's this window. We want it to be workable. We want it to respond it to actual vibration, but not too much that it actually falls over. And we came up with the box test, okay? And this is a very, very simple test. This is made up of two L's, okay? Made of, of, of wood. They're 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. These two L's are held together by these crazy expensive pipe clamps, $20, right? Home Depot, all right? So held together. We're actually going to fill this box up with nine and a half inches of unconsolidated concrete. There, there's a hole in the top and a hole in the bottom. I forgot to say that. Nine and a half inches of unconsolidated concrete. We're going to take a one inch diameter vibrator. This is not a paving vibrator. This is a stinger vibrator, like a bridge deck vibrator. We're going to turn it on. We're going to count to three as we go down. We're going to count to three as, as we come out. We're going to try to consolidate the concrete. Then we're going to, to immediately drop those pipe clamps off, pull the edges of the box down, and look. Did it fall over? Is there any honeycombing? What's going on? Well, let's see pictures. I like pictures. So that's what the test looks like at the beginning. There's the vibrator hovering above. Blah, 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 blah. Here it comes down. And it starts to consolidate the concrete. And you can see that there's something called a sphere of influence, right? We would say our concrete nerds out there would say, we've exceeded the plastic yield stress of that concrete. Right? That makes me excited, but it might not mean anything to you. So anyway, you have exceeded the plastic yield stress of the concrete. Yay! That's awesome. And then as we go down and as we start to pull the vibrator out, we can see this yield stress, this sphere of influence, this area of vibration, did not make it to the walls. You with me? It's stuck in the middle. That's not good. That's bad. Look, see, simple, right? Yes, no, good, bad, yeah. Okay, that's bad. That's what it looks like once you, once you drop the edges of the box off. Lots of holes, right? Lots of holes, that's bad. That's a failed box test. Okay? This is one that passes. It's like a beautiful concrete brownie, right? It's got no holes on the side, and the best tests, the absolute best tests I can stand on. That's me, one foot, like this, on top of the concrete, okay? But that's not part of the test, okay? That'd be cool if you ASTM'd me, right? You had to take me around and place me in these different places. I get to travel a lot. Now, you don't have to be able to hold this. This is 10-minute-old concrete holding me with no slumping. There's 2,200 pounds of rock in this mix, okay? A lot of material. Okay, so we use visual rankings. 
we use we 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 want mixtures. Pardon me, that are down here in the bottom. We want something that's either a one or a two. We don't want something that's a three or a four. And we go around the sides of the box. We rank each one of the sides, and we we average those rankings together. And we're shooting for a performance that looks something like this. We can also look at edge slumping. We can have bottom edge slumping. We can have top edge slumping. Here's some pictures. That's with no edge slump. There's, you can see the edge slump there at the top. That's got too much workability, right? Too much. So why does a mixture fail this box test? Well, it either needs more paste or more lubrication. We would say the yield stress is just way too large, okay? That, that, that's why, why, why it would actually fail. But what if we actually were able to find out how much water reducer it took to take to pass the box test. So this is explained in um, another way. Let's say I have a mixture and I hold everything constant. I hold the rock, the sand, the cement, the water constant. But if I use my water reducer as my variable and I vary it so it just passes, this is a way to compare mixtures to one another. Does that make sense? This is a way to compare mixtures. So that's what I'm going to do. And this is the box test evaluation procedure, right? We're going to mix concrete. We're going to run slump, unit weight, and air in the box test. We're going to ask this question, did it pass? If the answer is no, then we're going to throw everything back in the mixer except for the air pot. We trashed the air pot, right? Added water to the air pot. Throw it away. We're going to add water reducer. This is really important. We add water reducer. We mix everything back up again. We run slump, unit weight, and box test again. We ask the same question. We may go through this loop several times, several times in incremental dosages, so we figure out exactly how much water reducer it took to pass. After that, we add, we, we, we run air, we make cylinders, and we're done. The test is found to be accurate to be plus or minus two ounces per hundred weight. So all these numbers I'm going to show you coming up, they're all within plus or two ounces, plus or minus two ounces per hundred weight. The same box test performance was found if we added water reducer dosages in small dosages, or if we went back and just added it in one. We, we, we've done that. They may not be the same in the field, but for our laboratory mixes, it works well. The sample did not pass the box test within an hour. We, we actually trashed it. The box test correlated well with actual field paving mixes, and work is ongoing to look at multiple operators. So why did we do this? Because there's no test that can evaluate the workability of low slump concrete mixtures. And once we have this, we can truly start to look at gradations. We can truly start to look at what's important about different gradations. So we're going to look at that. 0.45 water cement ratio, 20% fly ash. These are all five sacks mixes, single sand source, three different limestone aggregates. That's what they look like, say cheese, right? And we're going to start out with the shillstone box. We're going to go to different places in the shillstone box. We're going to do mixes in the dead center. We're going to do mixes in the bottom on the far left, and then we're going to do a 60-40 blend, 60% coarse aggregate, 40% sand, the traditional, the traditional. And I'm going to show this data on terms of the 818 because it, it's going to mean something coming up. And this is, again, this 818 curve. This is sand. This is intermediate. This is, this is a larger aggregate. And this is how many ounces per hundred weight of water reducer it took to pass. Boy, 17, 8.3, that's not very good. That's a lot. That's, that's right. High dosage of water reducer is bad. We want low dosages, right? These aren't very good mixtures. Let's look at another mixture. Let's look at another mixture. Again, 15, 14, 13. Ugh. Let's all realize that all these, green, all these blue lines are dead center of the showstone box. Let's look at another one. What? What? What just happened? Zero? Let's look at this again. We have a big mountain over here, small mountain, intermediate. The bigger mountain goes down, it gets better. We knock everything down. We're in the terms of the 818, and we need no water reducer. This is awesome. This is awesome. This is really cool. Let's look at the shillstone box. Let's plot terms, everything in terms of the actual shillstone box. All three of these data points are in the exact same spot, yet they need drastically different amounts of water reducer dosage. Same thing in the bottom. Same thing on the left. So what can we say from this? Using the shillstone box or shillstone chart alone to proportion your aggregate does not influence performance. Okay? The 818 chart seems to provide much better guidance of what's actually going on here. Now, I have to ask this question, does distribution really matter? I have two aggregate mixtures that are that, that yet are in the very middle of the shillstone box, both of them 
but they have very different performance. And I'm going to sieve the purple one so it matches the blue. And they're the same. Zero. Whoa, what's going on? By changing the distribution of these aggregates, it changes the workability of the mixture. The Shillstone method, again, though, is just not accurate because remember, both of these are in the middle. Both of these are in the middle. Shillstone just, it just didn't do it for us on these. So let's start to really open this up. Let's start to really unlock some of the mysteries of optimized graded concrete. Let's take mixtures with sand contents being the same, and let's start teeter-tottering. Let's start teeter-tottering up and down. So here we have almost 100% large aggregate, almost no intermediate aggregate. We needed 13.3. We're going to reduce the large, increase the intermediate, reduce the large, increase the intermediate over and over and over again. And what do we see? We go from high, lower, lower. We found a sweet spot, ladies and gentlemen. And then we go high again. We found a boundary that bounds the performance. Important things are happening. We can do the same thing with sands. Okay? We can go from high down to low again. Uh, I'm sorry, high to low. And, and um, these are where we hold the intermediates in course in, in the actual same ratio. And again, we can see a minimum. There's a boundary here. We've done this with four different aggregates. We've done over 350 concrete mixtures. And we've done some, we've learned some really cool things. Lots of times people like to talk about valleys and how valleys are so bad. They love to complain how asphalt stole all of our 3 8 inch aggregate and we can't make optimized graded concrete. Well, let's look at that 3 8 Let's look right at that, that 3 8 right there. If I fill that in, I go from 4.3 to 2.4. That's better. But let's drop the 3 8 out. Let's have none. Asphalt, take it all. We can still make good concrete. We can still make a water discharge that only needs to be 3.4 ounces per hundred weight. There's no real difference between this material and any of the other ones. This is a way to really understand what's going on with our concrete mixtures. I want to say this. This is really important. I went low here, but notice I didn't go too high in either one of those two peaks. That is very very important. You cannot go too high in any one peak. We came up with this. This is the 350 mixes, four different course aggregates. We found, we come up with what we call the tarantula curve, okay, because it looks like a big spider, right? That's the head of the spider over here. That's the body. Those are the legs. I just like spiders, right? And every single boundary has a reason why it's there. There's a reason. There's a given reason why we can't use, for example, too much number 8 or number 16. In fact, you, you actually talked about finishing issues. We saw it right here. But if you can keep this below 12%, you're going to be okay from our mixtures, from our mixtures, right? <clears throat> this is cool. This is exciting. We've actually used this in the field. We've done 10 miles of CRCP pavement with this, and it performed awesome, okay? It performed awesome. Um, ODOT's actually looking to make this their optimized graded specification for the state of Oklahoma. So in conclusion, the box test was shown to be a useful tool to help understand the impact of gradation on the workability of paving concrete mixtures. The shieldstone box was not shown to be a useful method for these materials investigated. Remember, it's not useful by itself. You need to use it in combination if you use it. The 818 curve, this modified version of the 818 graph was shown to be a much better predictor of actual performance, and the Shillstone box, uh, or, uh, pardon me, the box test has been used to evaluate performance of pavement concrete mixtures, and um, recommended gradation limit has been produced. So if you have any questions, that's my website. You can email me. I'd love to do my best to answer them. Thanks. <laughs> In the interest of time, if you have any questions,